right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined from across the country in Atlanta by Brian Will. How are you doing, Brian? Good morning, John. How are you? I'm excited to be on the Sales Pop today. Yeah, absolutely. And Brian's an industry expert in sales and management consulting and the best-selling author of the book, The Dropout Multimillionaire and No and No, dot, 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 The Psychology yep. of the Negotiation, serial entrepreneur with over 35 years of experience. He has uh, created seven highly successful industries across four or as companies across four different industries worth half a billion dollars at their peak. Visionary business leader, owning restaurants in Atlanta, an insurance technology company in Denver, real estate in Georgia and Florida. His expertise in turnaround projects and driving billions in sales has made him a much sought after consultant and speaker. And what we're going to talk about today is, is that very thing, the psychology of sales and negotiation. Uh, so, Brian, um, first of all, let's get into the, you know, the psychology of sales and, and negotiations, the, the book you wrote. What was what was what prompted you to write that in the first place? You know, John, I've seen I've done sales training for, I don't know, 20, 25 mm -hmm. years now, and I've watched a million sales training programs. And what I found is most of the sales training programs out there are all about cheesy sales lines and trying to trick people and do things they don't want to do. And I've heard sales trainers say, you got to force these people. They don't want to do it, but you have to make them. And I thought, what a lousy way to train people. First of mm -hmm. all, we shouldn't be trying to force people to do something they don't want to do. And right. second, cheesy sales lines don't work, particularly in today's environment where you've got so much internet research you can do to figure out what things really cost and what they should cost and how things work. Sales to me is really more about the psychology of the sales process, what the client's thinking, how they're going to react to what it is you're going to say. And I always tell people, think about what you're saying to the client and mm -hmm. then think about how you would react if you were the client and somebody was saying that to you, and if your reaction would be negative, then your client's reaction is going to be negative. So don't do that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a it's a fascinating thing, Brian. Is that sometimes uh, says people when we cross the threshold of work, we completely forget everything that happens to us outside. To your point, is like we we don't like to be sold to like that. We don't like to be uh, your know, people to try cheesy lines or tactics on us. And then we cross the threshold of work, whether virtually or physically, and then we do the exact same thing to other people. Yep. It's funny to listen to salespeople, particularly newer salespeople, and I've done so much sales training. Mm -hmm. And you watch someone who may be having a conversation like you and I are doing right now, and you put them in a sales environment, and they completely change. You're like, hey, John, what's going yeah. on? You know, their voice goes up an octave, and they sound like they're excited, and they've just done, you know, a hit of cocaine before they were talking to you. <laughs> and it's like, who are you? You know? Mm -hmm. Stop, stop doing that. Just be a person. Just have a conversation. Let's just talk, you know. Uh, yeah. But most people think they have to do that and they don't. Yeah, and, it, and it, no, it's it's in, it's incredible, and and people, I, I think, unfortunately, are losing the art of conversation too. But uh, that's another story altogether. But uh, but I agree with you. I think it's and and I think more than ever. I mean, it, it's always been that case that uh, you know people want authentic people when they're working with them or whatever. I think the it was happening before COVID. COVID accentuated that. So I think if you're still relying on cheesy lines or scripts or you know little you know hacks or whatever. People's antenna are up. They want to. They want to work with people who who they see as authentic, but also you know people who, as you said, can have a a, com a real conversation, listen, understand, and validate. I tell people this all the time. Listen, when you, the minute you lay eyes on a on a prospect, the minute you your first words come out of your mouth, you need to understand that there is a wall of mistrust mm -hmm. between you and that client because you're a salesperson, because they naturally don't trust you. And your first job, the first objection you need to deal with as a salesperson is overcoming that wall of mistrust and beginning to get them to trust you at least a little bit and to like you a little bit. And you do that by being a genuine person, having a real conversation and, and just talking to somebody and do what we call active listening and connective response. Mm -hmm. We're trying to sell them in the first five seconds. How about we just meet them? Yeah, maybe that's a good place to start. <laughs> Absolutely. So talk to a little bit more about um, active listening, because I really think uh, I really think that 
a lot of people either have lost the ability or never knew what it was in the first place because you were fantastic at kind of half listening. And nowadays we're so distracted with devices and stuff. We're not probably half the time we're not listening at all because we're, mm-hmm. you know, flicking our eye down to our device. So talk about the power of active listening and how you can actually, you know, really focus on, on if you like training yourself to be so more we, active in your listening. Yeah. We call this active listening, connective response. So mm-hmm. The real key to master sales and master closing is for you to have the ability to make a connection, personal connection at some level with the person you're talking to. And it can be about anything, right? Whatever is in your background, there's probably a way you can make that connection. Mm -hmm. But you've got to use the act of listening to do that. And you've got to listen to what people tell you and then not just jump ahead into your sales script or your sales process. I've done this exercise so many times where I'll be talking, uh, training a sales team and I, I make everybody do role playing because role playing is the best way yeah. to do this. Right. And I'll have them start the sales script or start the sales process. And then I just say something really off the wall. Like, yeah, you know, I was selling a fire engine the other day and, you know, <laughs> we, we did it in green instead of red. And the person, because they're not, they're not actively listening. They go, well, that's awesome. By the way, let me tell you about my product some more. <laughs> instead of going, I'm sorry, what did you say? <laughs> you sold a fire engine. Like I didn't even know they And you see right now, John, you're laughing because I made you laugh, which means we've made a little connection. Yeah. People don't do, and if you will do that in the sales process and make that little connection, if you can make somebody laugh, they will begin to like you. They begin to like you. They'll begin to trust you. They begin to trust you. And the sales process has a much higher probability of closing. Yeah, because I mean, as you said, I mean, oftentimes, like the start of a call, or you get you you pick up the somebody call, you pick up the phone or whatever, and uh, as it says, it's the the fire hose opens, and it seems to be the first the first objective is to keep you on the phone. It's not uh, right. or to keep you in contact. It's not actually to listen or hear or whatever. It's just to stop you from going away. Yeah. And and it's amazing how how desperate that comes across and also how irritating it is for the receiver. Have you ever taken a call from somebody and they start talking and you try to answer or interrupt them and they just keep right on talking? Yep. Do you know how irritating that is? You just said it a second ago. Hey, guess what? If it irritates you, it irritates the person on the other end of the phone when you're doing it. So mm-hmm. don't do that. Just okay. don't. <laughs> so what are some of the what are some of the ways that people can actually? I mean, as you said, that was a great example about the fire engine. But uh, how they can start to engage better, better active listening, better like discovery, better better validation of what they're hearing. Because I always think that that's that's the biggest compliment. I think sometimes you can pay somebody is to really validate what they said and really show that you want to understand. You want to make sure that you understood what they said. It's really about asking questions, right? So Mm -hmm. we like to say that, you know, Jack Welch, one of the greatest CEOs in America, he was very well known for asking questions and not talking. And because of that, he was a great leader. He learned a lot. He would walk around the factories and just ask people questions. You as a salesperson need to do the same darn thing, right? If you are calling me about my product, I don't need to jump into my pitch. Mm -hmm. I just want to have a conversation. Hey, man, why'd you call today? Well, I'm looking for X, Y, Z. Why are you looking for that? Well, I need X, Y, Z, whatever. Well, have you shopped anyplace else? Well, yeah, I did. I shopped here and there. Well, I'm very familiar with them. It's a great company. Why didn't you buy from them? And they'll tell you why they didn't buy from them. By the way, mm-hmm. you're, you're, you're figuring out what not to do. Yeah. And you say, by the way, and by the way, John, you're from San Diego. We had this conversation a few minutes ago. You know, I love San Diego. In fact, I went out to the zoo there not too long ago with my kids thinking we were going to have this great experience. And all the animals were asleep. Like, <laughs> You see, I just made you laugh again. It's, a, yeah. it, it's absolutely a pointless conversation, but you say anything you can to just get the person to engage with you a little bit. Yeah, no, it's funny. I've, I've been to the San Diego Zoo and sometimes, yeah, you know, where you go to see the, uh, you go to see that great animal that you want to see and yeah. you can't see it, where you see their, their like tail sticking yes, out of some cave. Out of a bush. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, and, and it's so true. And I guess the other part is you were saying with like with negotiations. So when you first, contact somebody as a salesperson, the defenses are up and maybe you get beyond that, start to build. But when it gets to the negotiation phase, again, people tend to kind of retreat. And sometimes, you know, sometimes even in the negotiation, the salesperson starts to get a little bit unsure and kind of unravel some of the work that they've already done. Yeah, more than likely, that's because they didn't ask enough questions during Mm -hmm. the process, right? But so if you're going to buy my product or service, whatever it is, I need to make sure that I've asked you enough questions that I have figured out what your objections are going to be so that I can deal with them during that part Mm -hmm. of the process and not at the end. 
And so if I can figure out those objections and I can overcome them during the fact finding phase, then you don't have any objections left by the time we're done. Too many salespeople talk, 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 and then they get to the end of their talk and they don't know what to do because they never let the client talk. Mm. They never figured out what the client was thinking. If you can keep that client engaged and keep asking questions. And so, you know, I, I, I use things. you sell solar panels. Okay. So our solar panels, uh, this one package you're looking at produces 1.1 gigawatts, right? Does that make sense to you? Well, the first thing I want to know is if they get the <laughs> reference to back to the future, because that was, it, it's funny. <laughs> And if they go, what? And I go, I'm just kidding, man. You know about, yeah. and then I'll, you understand how much power, the, and I'll go into an explanation. And then I'm like, yeah. do you understand that? Yes. Is that what you're looking for? Do you need more or less? Well, I need more. Well, this is the price range. How do you feel about this price range? You know, it's all about the questions and answers during the fact finding, not about the presentation of your product. The presentation no. of your product is not where you sell them. Yeah. And I think I think sometimes, uh, you know, people think because of the, you know, the, the product, they're, the product they're selling or whatever, you know, that they have to be a certain way. But I tell you, one of the best sales experiences I had um, in the last couple of years was uh, was when I had to get the AC units uh, replaced and I called a couple of companies. But one of this one guy came in and he loved AC. He was so enthusiastic about it. He, you know, explained everything. He told me what, what I needed, what I didn't need. And he said, you know, and, and get all the options. It was great. By the end of it, I was actually interested in AC. Yeah. And, I, and when I pass the units today, I still think, oh, yeah, yeah. But it was all <laughs> because, guy. yeah, because not only, not only did he explain things, but he was, he was super, like, genuinely enthusiastic about what he was doing. He, he was a good salesperson. Guy's mm -hmm. probably selling the wrong thing. We should have him sell multi-million dollar software packages. He'd make 10 times as much money. Exactly, exactly. Um, but it's a, it's another good example, as you were saying, is if you, if you come into it with the right attitude and approach, it can really disarm the uh, the the prospect uh, right. you know, very quickly. Uh, and But I think it's all about, because if I don't feel that confidence from you, if I don't feel that, that I'm, I'm suspicious immediately. Yeah. And again, so the example I like to use is too many salespeople think they need to explain everything there is to know about the product, the industry, mm -hmm. the hit and the clients, number one, aren't listening because they don't care. Yeah. Number two, they don't understand half of what you're saying. So you've lost them. And when you lose a client, by the way, you've lost the sale yep. and they never stop talking. The example I always love to use is, uh, John, have you ever gone and bought a new car off a car lot? Sure. Okay. When you walked onto the car lot, right? And you met that salesman for the first time. Did he whip out the product manual for the car and say, Hey, I need you to read this before we go out and look at the car. <laughs> no, he didn't. But did he take you back to the finance department to look at that 32 page contract oh, that's yeah, on yeah. one sheet of paper before? No, 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 no. It's all those details are irrelevant at this point. I need you to fall in love with whatever I'm selling based on what mm -hmm. you're looking for. And that involves two or three or four hot buttons. If I can get you to fall in love, we'll talk about the rest of the stuff later. But until you yeah. fall in love, all that all that detail you think you're explaining to them because you have to be the smartest person in the room is irrelevant. Probably lost them in conversation, confused them, and they're not going to buy from you. Talk way, way, way less. That's what I tell people. And and it's an inter I mean, it is an interesting example too because if you think about like going onto the dealership, I mean, you may wander by the sports car and just look in the window of it because you thought, wow, that's kind of cool looking, and the salesperson comes out. And, and suddenly they're trying to sell you a sports car, but they haven't actually engaged in a conversation. And it turns out, no, actually, you need a, you need a, a kid carrier. Yeah, I, I have a perfect example I use in some of my training. I, and this is a true story. I mm -hmm. saw a car in the paper for 19 grand. It was a Trans Am. This is like 30 years ago. You could buy a car for 20 grand. <laughs> I go down to the car lot. I'm looking at the car and the guy comes out and we talk for two minutes. And I said, well, how much is this? And he says $30,000. And immediately I'm out. I can't afford $30,000. And he said, well, you know, here's my card. Get back to me, you know, if you change your mind or whatever you want to do. And I walked off the lot. You know what that guy should have done? He should have said, listen, this is $30,000, but I'm telling you, the minute you drive it off the lot, it loses 20% in value. I got one that's two years old over here. Same car, beautiful condition, still has a warranty. I can get you in that for 20. Do you want to take a look at that? Mm. I would have bought a car that day. Right. But he didn't have that conversation with me. He was trying to sell me that car I looked at the first time and that turned out to be I, I fell for the advertising, by the way. I, I love to say that. 
<laughs> yeah, but, no, but I, I, you know, I, but I like about that story as well is, I mean, how often does that happen? How often does do people just shut down immediately because oh, it's that he's not going to buy it, and not even bothering to to explore the explore the options or have the conversation? Yeah. And it's I, I feel like it's that early stage of the process that that's where a lot of people get lost because as you alluded to earlier if you're asking the questions if you're under if you're clarifying and validating the objections should all have really been taken care of before you get down the road to negotiations um but it means that you have to put that extra work in early in the process to make sure that you are asking the right questions you are engaging properly you are looking at uh, uh, options that's the difference between a master closer and an average salesperson and what we call retail geese. Mm -hmm. So the funny story is my, my partner and I had this company and we had a big call center and a bunch of people and he had this farm and on his farm, we had a big back deck and the deck looked over a pond with apple trees. We're sitting out there one day and there's a bunch of geese standing under the apple trees looking up. And I, he said, you know what those geese are doing? I said, they're waiting for an apple to fall. <laughs> he goes, yeah, by the way, you know, geese can fly, right? I'm like, Oh my God, that's like our bottom tier salespeople. They can fly, but they're just standing there waiting for the darn apple to fall. And that's what we call yeah. the retail geese salespeople. Master closers don't do that, man. They figure out how to make it happen. Yeah, and and I and I think unfortunately, uh, the last number of, of of years or whatever, with the with the big focus on inbound and this, mm -hmm. that we've we've created a, we created a monster in many ways of people who think that if they sit there long enough, the apples will fall, and they don't have to go you know get them themselves uh, right. and i think that's and i think that's such a great analogy about the geese is you know i mean i wish more people would sort of say no i i'm not going to sit around and wait i'm going to be proactive i'm going to go out there and i'm going to explore properly and i bet you those master sales people are the ones who who at the end move less through their pipeline in terms of opportunity volume often but they're the ones who close a higher volume of business yeah we call it understanding what a no is Right. Mm -hmm. I always tell, look, if you, if your close rate in your company, let's say it's 30%, I just am on a project right now with a company, there's just 30%. That still means 70% of the people you talk to aren't going to close. Right. If I can teach you what a no is and still keep you within your 30% close margin, you can move through your contacts faster and close more revenue at the same percentage by understanding who will and who will not buy. And that's how you continue to make more and more and more money. I've never met a company yet who said, listen, as long as your close ratio is at 30%, I need to stop you at three sales a week. <laughs> yeah, no, ab absolutely. And, uh, and it's funny. Uh, I did an exercise a number of years ago at a company I was running for, and the parent company came back to me because I said, we're going to clean up. We're going to do this properly. We're going to clean up our pipeline. We're going to really be rigorous in in early stage qualification. And so we shrunk our pipeline, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because we took a lot of junk out of it. And, and we were closing more faster, better. But the parent company was like, hang on, your pipeline is your pipeline is mm -hmm. like it was five times last year. It's only th three times. What's going on? And you're going, um, actually, well, we're selling more. <laughs> yeah, we're selling more. But it's funny <laughs> the psychology of it. Yeah, it's Hey man, you've been around, if you've been around as long as I have, we used to do pipelines out of a notebook, right? Yeah. Today we have these fancy CRMs, right? Like the one you, you own yep. uh, that just accelerate your ability to do your job where we used to have to flip through page after page after page and tear them out, wad them up and throw them in the trash can. And <laughs> I mean, your ability to sell is so much easier today if you just understand the basics. Yeah, and unfortunately, I mean, it's been made. It, it's it's easier, but people aren't taking advantage of it a lot. I mean, because you remember in the in the old days, I mean, if you you only had a certain amount of hours in the day, and you had a telephone mm -hmm. or whatever, maybe even before email, so you had to be pretty selective. Can can I can I can I say something harsh on here for one yeah, second, yeah. John? Sure. If your sales team is struggling with that, it is the sales manager's fault. Mm hmm. Yep. Because he is not doing his job to train his people how to maximize the efficiency with the tools that have been made available to them. Yeah, no, and and I agree. And often that unfortunately comes from either you know sales managers just being promoted out of salespeople mm -hmm. and not given any you know training or or uh, you know how to manage. It also it also comes out of lack of you know, executive uh, sponsorship and showing, mm -hmm. because, you know, as you know, people take their cues from whoever they work for. If the uh, sales manager doesn't seem to think it's important, then you're not going to pay any attention to it. 
I literally sat in an offsite meeting two weeks ago and told this executive team, your team isn't performing at the level they could, and it's your fault. And you've already paid me, so you can't fire me for saying that. And so I'm telling you, it's your fault. <laughs> and they were like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> And what was it? So, so the reaction, and then they, they realized, and then they then they had some insight. The end result was they've now hired me on an annual contract to come out and work with their sales team. Uh, excellent. Well, listen, <laughs> Brian, this has been this has been fantastic. The time has flown by. All of Brian's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little more about what you do. Uh, well, my website is brianwillmedia.com. I do executive and business coaching. Uh, we do sales training for individuals and teams, and we also do business coaching and consulting for what we call the five to $50 million uh, entrepreneur business range. So go to the website, check out the books. I've written a couple of bestsellers. The, the podcasts are on there. Uh, if you have any questions, just drop me a message. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll have everything linked below so that you can easily get to it. And I would encourage you to go check it out. So thanks again, Brian. Thank you for watching, listening. I'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Thanks, John.